Hello, I'm Pastor Brian Mallison. Welcome to worship at Christ Lutheran Church, Visalia, California. Our worship theme for this month has been unrelenting joy. We have discovered as we have been reading St. Paul's letter to the Philippians, that joy for Paul is a little bit different from what you might have thought about in terms of joy. Joy, we discovered in our first week, is found when the community of faith works together to do the work of the kingdom of God. It's people together. Then the second week, we heard that joy happens in us when we put others first, just as Jesus consistently put the needs of others ahead of himself. And then last week, we heard that joy is rooted in what God has done for us in the past. And we can return to those moments whenever we remember that God's grace has mattered for us. Today, we conclude our worship ser series for the month of June with the invitation into graduate level joy. Welcome. We gather for worship in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lauren Chambers and I am a presiding minister here at Christ Lutheran Church in Visalia, California. I am so glad that you are able to join us for online worship this morning. Though we remain distanced, we are not separated, and we encourage you to stay connected with this church community through social media, Zoom meetings, email, or even phone calls. 
During these months of isolation, we may dwell on our own needs while ignoring the challenges of those around us. We bring our feelings before God in confession. This time of confession is not just our time to say, I'm sorry to God, but a chance to seek reconciliation with our Creator, to turn away from ourselves and to be inspired to carry the burdens of others. Please pray with me. Dear Lord, just as you came to earth to commit yourself to us, so also you call us into a life of community with one another. With so much need right now, we are tempted to look away from that which is stressful or painful to our neighbor. We often make choices that benefit ourselves rather than thinking of the needs of others. We ask for your forgiveness, Lord, for ignoring the needs of those around us. And we know that during this time of forced isolation, fellowship and caring and love must be more intentional. Once again, we seek to make amends for our selfish ways of living and to take on the way of Jesus, the way of serving. Let your love for your creation flow through us so that we may begin to treat others with the selfless compassion, just as you have shown compassion to us. Amen. As a fellow sinner and recipient of God's grace and mercy, I declare to you the good news that your sins are forgiven in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I have two Kairos moments that really stand out in my mind um, in the last few months. Um, the first one is um, when we were first sheltered in place, my husband and I talked about how our mothers would have handled being shut off from everybody. Um, Pete's mom was in assisted living place in the Bay Area and she had a very tiny studio apartment and on a good day, she did not like being there, um, but she could have visitors. But in the current situation, that wouldn't have happened and, and um, it wouldn't have been good. My mom lived in her own home, but her entire social life revolved around going to eat her meals at a restaurant. So the owners and the employees, they were her family. And uh, when we would chat on the phone, she would tell me everything that was going in the going on in the lives of, of these people, even though I didn't know them. But, you know, they meant a lot to my mom and um, it just would have been extremely difficult for her to be isolated from, from those people that she loved. Um, so those situations kind of got me started in thinking about people at our church that are in the same situation. And I enjoy making cards, and so I thought, okay, I'm just going to send cards to these people. And I called the church office and got some names and went through the directory. And um, so every three or four weeks, I just send a bunch of cards out to people from church just to let them know that they are loved, God loves them, and they're being prayed for. Um, that just kind of blossomed into... Um, thinking about the people at Kawea Manor, uh, the staff and the residents. So I made cards uh, for those people. And again, I just wanted them to know that they're appreciated, uh, they're loved um, by us and by God. Um, the second Kairos moment that I'm kind of going through right now um, is I'm having surgery and it just kind of started as a pinch in my shoulder and it didn't go away. So I went to my doctor, had the MRI done. He said, everything is fine. All you need is physical therapy. So I started physical therapy and three weeks turned into five weeks, turned into seven weeks. And my shoulder was just not where it needed to be. So I started asking friends um, if they'd had any experiences with orthopedic surgeons in Visalia, thinking that it was gonna take me months to get in. So I got the name of a doctor, um, I called him, I was able to get in within two weeks. When I went to my first appointment, at the end of that appointment, I already had a surgery date. So from the time I first called to the time I had the, I'm having the surgery, it was only a month. So I feel God has been in this whole situation and I know that he will watch over me. I feel very at peace about it. I have lots of people praying for me and um, 
I'm just, I'm just thankful for all of this. Jesus on the side 
Good morning. Today's reading comes from Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 through 8. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, beloved, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is anything excellent and if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Here ends the reading. Rejoice. Again, I say rejoice. Today marks the beginning of the fourth month of online services that are watchable anytime. And I still am up here wanting to say good morning. Rejoice. One day last week, I stopped by the grocery store on my way home from church and I got out of the car and I headed in and I suddenly felt really free and really good like this instant euphoric good mood a few steps through the parking lot later and i realized that the reason i felt so good is because i'd forgotten to mask up i went back and got it and that good mood just disappeared rejoice i have a piece of news that is actually making me happy Starving, dying kittens showed up in our yard about a week and a half ago, and they're all still alive. And the night before they showed up, I told my husband, Lim, that I would really love to have an orange cat again since it's been a couple of decades. <laughs> well, that orange kitten with the Scottish fold ears is completely perfect. And if you follow me on Facebook or Instagram, you know that I take way too many pictures of him. Rejoice. Well, kittens aside, I'm still forcing myself to watch the news and read the newspaper. There's a song, and if you're watching the contemporary service right now, you just heard it. And it just sums up my daily heartbreak with this question that's cried out into the world. Is anyone worthy? Can anyone save us from ourselves and from each other? Can anyone break the seals, it asks, open the scroll and give us an answer? Well, into this question, and every question, Paul charges the church at Philippi and us, rejoice. Again, I say, rejoice. Come on, Paul. That may be easier for you to say. You were writing while you were in Rome, and about the year 60, Rome might have had its issues, but we are living in the year that keeps on giving. This month, our cities and our culture have been on fire. Okay, Rome burned, I know, but that was, well, really close to the same time you were writing this letter. Rejoice. But we have been cooped up for four months. Oh, when this letter was written, you had been imprisoned for two years, you say? Rejoice. But Paul, we win. Epidemic. Oh, now you're going to mention the plagues that were brought to Rome from campaigns across the East? Fine. Rejoice. I have just one more thing to say. Murder hornets. Yeah, Paul, you can't compete with that, can you? But still, he says, rejoice. And in all seriousness, how? How can we rejoice? Why should we? Well, I think the key to everything Paul has to say and the key to graduate level joy is simple and it stands out all by itself in this passage god is near rejoice god is near 
when everything is chaos and we have no idea what's coming next, God is near. And Paul seems to think that that simple knowledge can bring us to a place of joy. It's so simple and not at all simplistic or easy. I've been reflecting on this as I go through seminary and graduate level work in theology. There's so many layers to our understanding of God. There's so much complexity and so much nuance And these layers are important, but they're not the center. They all circle back to the simplicity of God at the center of everything. A simple idea, but not an easy one. And maybe it never has been, but especially right now, things are happening And changes are occurring that are drawing us out and away from what we know or knew or assumed. Theologians and philosophers call this a liminal event. Now, please hear that carefully. That's liminal, not limforgy. Liminal. Something is liminal when it's part of a transition between the old and the new. Liminal things exist at the same time on both sides of a barrier or a major change or a shift in thinking. And right now, that's us. We're in a liminal time, a time when we can really see that there's a difference between things as they are now and a future moment where God's handiwork is more evident than ever before. I don't know what that future looks like. And if we limit our understanding to current events instead of the promises of God, the future can look bleak. So how will we approach it? With fear or with joy? We need this liminal, changing, boundary-crossing time. But while we're crossing it, it can seem like a giant abyss. God is near. Our God of transitions. Our God who transcends all barriers. Our God who hovered over the chaotic waters and said, let there be light. Our God who parted the chaos of the Red Sea and delivered Israel from bondage. Our God who sweat blood in the garden of Gethsemane and said, not my will, but yours be done. God is near. Rejoice. And though we may say, but we can't see God, Paul was waiting for that objection. He tells the church at Philippi and us how to recognize them. Did you catch it? He says, finally, beloved, whatever is true, Whatever is honorable, whatever is righteous, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence and if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. If you want to see God, look for truth, even when it's hard to face. Look for what is honorable, not being honored ourselves, but honoring others. That's a simple thing, but not easy. God is near. Bring your thoughts to whatever is pure and lovely. These are gifts from God for our enjoyment. It is a gift from God to have pictures of an orange kitten on your Instagram feed. Enjoy them. Enjoy the glance up at the mountains the glory in creation, the joy of good food, the dip in the lake or pool on a hot day, love shared with friends and family or even with God's other creatures. God is near. Take joy in these lovely, pure moments, especially when honesty about the world forces you to recognize that they're rare. And spare a moment for a prayer of gratitude and your joy in them will be even more full. And then, search for righteousness. 
God's righteousness is at the center of everything that Paul is addressing. What is it? Well, it's not self-righteousness. It's Christ's righteousness in us. Actions which resemble the kingdom of God over the values of the world. Actions that don't ask, what will happen to me if I take action, but what will happen to you if I don't? That is righteousness. Simple, but not easy. Sometimes even risky. To change our thinking from, will things be hard for me at work if I'm seen with a sign that says Black Lives Matter, to what could happen if I don't? Or from, will I be giving up my rights if I wear a mask, to what will happen to another person I could infect if I don't? God's righteousness is Christ in the garden. Not my will, but yours be done. Paul says to think this way. God is near. Living in a time when there is so much that we live through and say, this is changing and maybe this needs to change. Paul reminds us to find joy in the things that are worthy of praise. They are there. And where they are, God is also. And God's presence, no matter the circumstances, gives us permission to find joy. I admit this can be a strange thing for me. Sometimes I question whether it's right for me to feel the joy that I do when there's so much suffering. But Paul gives us permission to see Jesus. And in this liminal, boundary-breaking, shaken-up time, I'm seeing Jesus everywhere. I see Jesus in the eight-year-old in this congregation whose heart got turned upside down this month, and so he decided to raise money for the NAACP. And I see Jesus in all the people who joined him. Rejoice. I see Jesus in people in this faith family that are going out of their way each and every week to check on people who shouldn't be leaving their homes, buying them groceries, picking up their prescriptions, offering a few kind words. Rejoice. I see Jesus when these crazy times bring up questions in people who hadn't thought a lot about God before. And sometimes I'm even the one who gets to hear these questions. Rejoice. I see Jesus in every person walking around a grocery store with an uncomfortable, unflattering mask on their face, knowing that it doesn't protect them all that much, but protects others a lot. And I rejoice. Again, I say rejoice. And the reason is so very, very simple. Christ has come. Christ is here. Christ is coming. In this world where everything is changing and the future seems uncertain, Jesus is the answer to the cries of our hearts. He is worthy. In the words of the song I mentioned earlier, do you feel the world is broken? We do. Do you feel the shadows deepen? We do. But do you know that all the dark won't stop the light from getting through? We do. Do you wish that you could see it all made new? Oh, we really do. And it's coming. Rejoice. Amen. Is all creation groaning? It is. Is the new creation coming? It is. Is the glory of the Lord to be the light within our midst? It is. Is it good that we of this. 
a high school, it almost acts as like a, as a safety net for everything. Like it's, when all else fails, I mean, you, you always have your youth group, like always something to turn to when things go wrong or when you need guidance or help with, with anything in, in high school or in life. Now those people are never gonna turn away from you or do anything really harmful for you. It's it's all it's all positivity. There's no there's no bad side to youth group. It's all it's all there to help you and, and guide you really, no matter what. I guess teaching me like how everyone's story is different, how how to treat people differently de depending on their needs or depending on their life situations and, and stuff like that. And really. It's also obviously helped me with my my religious life. Like, you know, I don't don't know how how much I would even know God or if I'd know Him at all if, without this youth group. Uh, the youth group does a good job of involving God in everything that you do, you know, and and spreading God's positivity through everyone. But mostly just how to how to treat people like well at all times, no matter where they come from, what's their background, who they are, their history. It does a good job of teaching you how to love everyone, how to love your neighbor as yourself, pretty much. And it, well, it needs to exist. Um, it teaches how it teaches high schoolers and middle schoolers how to how to be open-minded. If someone was going into youth group, I would tell them go in there and just give it a shot. When I went in there, I. I wasn't a whole big fan of youth group when I started my first trip. I really didn't want to go. My my dad and my grandparents made me go. I I didn't want to have anything to do with it, but I went and it really just just opened my mind. It's just so much positivity. This it allows you to see how God works through everything. How how he really is a part of everything in life. And, you know, before before those youth trips and before I really started going to youth group, I you know, I didn't care. I, you know, I knew God was real, but I didn't didn't really think about Him too often. Didn't mean too much. But it really teaches you how how He is a part of everything. How He is everything. Before then, I I had no clue. I had no idea. That's what youth group did for me, at least, and that's what I would tell anyone else trying to join. Okay, okay so in youth group we do a we do the the last. The last uh, like little service get together on the groups, and when we went to San Diego, <laughs> I was, I was something. We, I think every single person in the room cried, and there's just the overwhelming feeling of love in the air. I mean, it was it was unlike anything else. Like you just, you just felt a, a bond and connection with every single person in the room through, through God. And I mean, those those trips you go you grow closer to everyone, but you grow a whole lot closer to God as well through those trips. And that one was, I mean, that was incredible. It was a feeling like any like nothing before, like nothing else. I mean, I wouldn't really have a relationship with God without this youth group. I, I, you know, I'd, I'd be kind of living more on a limb, kind of not really thinking too much, kind of just doing whatever. Um, I'd have a whole lot harder of a time finding peace and and getting over hurdles and humps in life. Um, life would be a whole lot harder without without youth group. That's that's for certain. We are invited by God to pray with boldness, joy, and confidence, knowing that our prayers will be heard by a loving and gracious God. Please join me as we pray to be God's hands and feet in this world. Lord, we continue to seek your guidance and reassurance as we navigate these unparalleled times. As our world still faces the threat of COVID-19, we pray that there will come a day when lives are no longer lost to this virus. We ask for healing and wholeness to be brought upon those who have been affected and pray for the families who have lost loved ones to this terrible pandemic. Please bring safety and protection to healthcare workers who are putting their lives at risk to heal those who have been infected. As restrictions continue to lift, help us to continue to put the safety of others above all else, 
because in doing so, we fulfill Jesus' commandment to love our neighbor. Lord, we recognize that this time of forced isolation has brought out a lot of anxiety and depression for many. We ask that you help us in our struggle to find a new normal and to bring encouragement to those whose daily lives have changed significantly because of this pandemic. In a society that values productivity, help us to remember that we were created as human beings rather than human doings. Our significance is not based on the work we do. We are worthy because we are loved by a God of grace. Paul's letter to the Philippians reminds us to rejoice in the Lord. There may be times when we struggle to find joy in our everyday lives, but it is through the grace and mercy of Jesus that we are brought true joy. Amidst the conflict, loneliness, and struggles the past few months have brought about, we realize that there are reasons to be thankful because of the joy that comes from Jesus. Let this joy awaken in us and make us alive. Let us actively seek the joy that surrounds us with you at the center of our lives. We pray in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Well, once again, welcome to Worship at Christ Lutheran Church. I have a couple of uh, very important announcements to share with you. The first is I'm, I'm so happy to announce that our search team has found our new church administrator, Lou Wessler. Lou and his wife, Pat, have been members of Christ Lutheran Church for a number of years. We're so fortunate that Lou will be stepping into this position. He will officially start on July 1st. Please. Keep Lou in your prayers. And then let me take this opportunity to update you regarding our effort to safeguard the health and well-being of our members and our guests and to speak to the idea of regathering. You have done well. I'm so proud of this church who remains committed to worshiping this way each and every week to continue to engage with one another in creative ways, and to financially support your church. I know it hasn't been easy, but you are an amazing church. So when will we regather? The short answer is, we hope to regather by Labor Day weekend. I know that's still a way off, but won't it be great to be able to see one another again, to, to gather and worship again? But the longer answer is that we are still in a holding pattern as far as our county goes, and even more as our leadership places the health and well being of our members and guests above everything else. So we will be paying close attention to the medical community and keeping a vigil of prayer to ascertain when it will be the safest to gather again. But please know. Whenever that is, we will continue to offer online worship for those who choose to remain extra careful. But there are other ways that we are giving consideration for limited gathering. For instance, our church office will be set to reopen the week of July 13th. We request that all visitors to the church office would wear a face mask and maintain a six foot distance from one another. In addition, we're looking for opportunities when we might be able to gather in a limited way, for instance, by celebrating the faith of two of our confirmation students, or looking for ways to gather to celebrate the lives of those who have passed away in the last three and a half months. And we're looking forward to a to continuing our limited gathering events, such as the Sunday evening call to prayer. And then at the end of July, our conversation for those reading the book, Dear Church. 
So in small ways, we are creating opportunities to be together as the church. Please keep your church leadership in your prayers as decisions get made. Know that this is hard for everybody involved, but stay tuned as well for additional information to come. God bless you. And now receive the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and grant you peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>